Hello and welcome to Say Hi to the Future, Ingenious Thinkers, a podcast aimed at highlighting the human side of ingenuity. My name is Ken Tenser, curator of Say Hi to the Future, helping leaders think differently in the face of uncertainty and ambiguity. With me today is Suzanne Le Boutelier, leadership change and strategy speaker. Suzanne, welcome to Say Hi to the Future. Hi, Ken. Um, I'm excited to say hi to the future. It's full of possibilities. It is. And I'm going to start with something provocative that that you wrote and and it really made me think. It's a question. It says, do you want to be one of the 10% experiencing high performance and well-being or will you languish with 90% of people in workplaces? So, I mean, that's um, that's really embracing a lot of people in different ways, Suzanne. So where it does is. that come from? <laughs> well, um, I think we have we know someone um, in common. That's Karen Fuster. And when I did the accreditation for the indicator of ambiguity and looked at all of the research and the evidence that was there, it really hit home for me that um, ambiguity is just absolutely everywhere in our life, yet when we actually look at how it shows up for people at work, only 10% of people in the research studies actually had a clear tolerance of ambiguity. And when I thought about it and I thought, well, that means that 90% of people aren't don't have the skills or they're not using those skills to help them actually thrive in those types of environments. Mm-hmm. And so... I would really love for more people. <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd love for it not to be 90%. I'd love to flip it and actually help people understand the really simple things that they can work on to um, have a completely different, less stress-inducing experience um, when right. they come across ambiguity. Yeah. So so when you mention that, there, there's, there's a really interesting or really important insight I think you bring out. I mean, do they have these skills or don't they? Have they simply not developed them? And, you know, I'm of the age where the world spun a little bit more slowly. When I started my career, we, I, I don't want to say it, we had dumb terminals instead of computers. We were faced with a certain amount of ambiguity, but I had a year to figure it out. Now I have uh, an hour, a day, whatever. Mm-hmm. Cho- choose. So, is it that we don't have it or is it just a muscle we've never needed? I think it's a mix. I think there are some things that we, in our head, we know that we should be doing this more often, but we haven't yet translated it into a regular habit and we don't understand its value. So we're not motivated to use it when we could be. Um, And then for other things, it's probably a lack of, awareness so there's eight skills and I like to think of them as not just about ambiguity I think they're a really lovely set of skills that you can use to thrive as a leader generally and think about how do you actually join them together in a situation so your mindfulness comes across to some people as very woo-woo but it's not going and meditating every day and those sorts of things I believe in helping people get taking a breath, getting really deeply present and just having that moment to go, where am I? What's going on around me? What's happening with me? What's happening with the people and you know, the system around me? And what's my next best right move? Um, and then you sort of think through, well, what are the other skills that you can actually tap into? What's going to help me most here? I could use that. Then I could tap that one onto the end of that. And then you start to find a bit of a path forward. Mm -hmm. And for some people, it is a total lack of awareness. But for other people, it is, I know I should be doing these things, but I'm just not intentionally doing it. And it hasn't become a habit. I appreciate mindfulness. And I think a whole bunch of people have scolded me for my views of like, it's great outside of work. And I know that I'm wrong. So you don't have to convince me. But I... (laughs) I, I, I think that one of the things that I do take from mindfulness in my in my um, personal life, and, and as you said, it helps you become present, is the notion of empathy. One of the challenges we have 
where we faced with ambiguity is we've not develop, developed the skill to empathize with others in a situation. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. And what I find fascinating in this space is as I've been um, doing the indicator of ambiguity assessments with people, you know, you come across people, and I have to say, some of them a little bit like me, in that um, you're quite comfortable or you're at ease with ambiguity and you've got this real desire for challenging work. So you go into a meeting and you might see half the people wilting in the room because the complexity and the ambiguity is just piling on and they're just you see them deflating. Whereas um, other people are starting, their, their brain's firing, you know, they can go, oh, there's this and then there's this and then there's this. And I'm one of those people who gets a bit strangely excited and comes out and goes, oh, like, this is really exciting. But when that happens um, and, you know, there's all these unknowns, because you've been in situations like that before, you forget that the way you're responding isn't the way everyone else mm -hmm. is responding. And what I often see is those people can tend to forget to manage the uncertainty and the lack of clarity for the people around them. But what they don't realise is they're also missing out on something themselves. So when you take a more empathetic approach and you're actually thinking, okay, um, I might be really excited about what's going on here, but I'm noticing these other people around me aren't. And so using that much deeper curiosity and opening up conversations and um, being genuinely deeply interested in other people's perspective and sharing insights and building and generating um, ideas and acknowledging feelings really helps to deepen your own understanding and it might introduce new possibilities that you'd never ever thought about. So to me, empathy has a payoff. It's not just about the other person. It's actually about that deeper connection and how you can learn and grow together. And, and I love that um, that deeper connection. Um, I, and and I mean, bringing that into a very pragmatic world, I mean, when we work at it, and and I'd love to hear your how you do it, but I mean, having people from different parts of an organization, different levels, um, understanding what um, a decision by operations or, or by fan, finance means to the other person. Finance means to operations, operations to finance. We make so many decisions um, just isolated. And, and, mm -hmm. and, and then we wonder why nobody buys in. Yeah, yeah. Look, this hit home for me many years ago earlier in my career, Ken, when I was working in industrial relations and we were in a big enterprise bargaining agreement. And before then we'd always done position-based bargaining where you'd have just the, the people who were the negotiators around the table. This time we brought in um, a whole team of management doctors and a whole team of union doctors. And as we were going through the process, we adopted interest-based bargaining. And, um, and I know Charles Stewart, referred to it in his recent book, Super Connectors, which I thought, oh, someone else is, likes this. But what really home hit home for me was when we'd come up with a good idea, one of the doctors on our team was terribly good at unpacking it and saying how other people are going to see it, you know, how are they going to use it in the workplace? So we were actually able to work through all the perverse consequences of the options that we were looking at. And so he got us really thinking about not just what's the intent that we're trying to achieve here, but how is it going to be interpreted by other people? How's it actually going to play out in practice? Mm -hmm. And that's why I think there is such value in not just holding everything close to yourself, you know, um, ruminating on everything in your head and just making sure that you are going and thinking through and having conversations with people. Um, and you don't have to say, I'm thinking of doing exactly this. What do you think? But it's thinking about, well, what are the questions I can ask and be really curious and understand how people are responding to that and how they will see it. And I work with other organisations these days and sometimes, you know, people explain things at their level 
Mm-hmm. And they don't actually think about who is my audience and really frame it in a way that they can understand and relate to and then ask some follow-up questions to right, make sure right. it's been understood in the way that you intended it to be understood. Yeah. And be open to to change what you're doing as well. Right. And so how, how does this fit into, I mean, change what you're doing? Um, how does this fit into resolving challenges? I mean, I'm obviously a huge believer in empathy and it's built into our processes, blah, blah, blah. I'm much bigger on saying, go figure it out, giving people challenges and go figure it out. And, and, and in the middle of it, they'll ask me a question and I'll just look at them and say, that's a great question and walk away. <laughs> like, how do we just uncoddle people and say, deal with uncertainty? Are we just like building in a generation of hear the answers for you (laughs) yeah yeah look um generative ai like i've got um young young adult children and i compare where they are now to where i was at their age and everything's at their fingertips they can google it the algorithms just anticipate what they want and so when things don't go the way that they expect they you know well it's ring mum or (laughs) ring dad Mm. Because they're sort of lost. So, and I know I see this play out because I do quite a bit of complex facilitation. So I did a board strategy day earlier this week and I just had to say to them, look, can I just ask you to trust in the process? And similarly, you know, you take them through the steps, but it's like, well, it's not up to me to interpret it. It's what do you think? Yeah. Um, Yeah. And just creating that space for people to actually think and engage rather than expect the answers to be served up to them. Yeah. It's also when you see the that interaction between people, um, that whole idea of um, I have this real thing when I facilitate around I don't like creating places for people to have discussions mm-hmm. because when you have a discussion, you're trying to convince the other person why you're right. But when you have a a generative dialogue, you're actually listening without judgment, you're genuinely curious, and you're looking to how you can build on and continue to explore what you're sort of batting back and forth with the other person. And I think that just opens up so many new possibilities, whereas a discussion is really closed. Yeah. This ties into something else you wrote recently, Um, Mm -hmm. and it's about honing your instincts and, and tapping into your empathy and your desire to understand. But when I think about instincts, um, I talk about living, like I I live in my gut, like I I absolutely live in my gut. And I'm not saying that's a good place to live. I'm not saying that's the right place to live. There's there's a number of places you can live that may be better. Um, But I think that after again, you know, 30 odd, well, 35 years of entrepreneurship, like there's a point where something is yummy or it's yucky. And you got to make a decision. So how how do you, you know, again, you talk about honing your instincts. How how do you do that? To me, like, I I think you have to feed your intuitive gut. So if you close yourself off from the world and from what's going on for you, then um, your gut's not going to be a great guide. Whereas if you are continually feeding your gut a range of different perspectives, um, you you just keep being deeply curious um, and you're continually learning from what's going on around you. So you're actually taking a moment to think about how did that go? What went well? What didn't? What do I need to remember for next time? Mm-hmm. It's feeding it, but it's also when you're going to call on your gut, it's tuning in to what's going on right now. So that, yeah. and this is where I think it's understanding the difference between um, an intuitive gut and an instinct. And sometimes instincts aren't the best because they're all about um, how we've evolved as humans. So I know if I, I live in a semi-rural area and on our local Facebook group, you know, people keep putting up these posts about, can you identify this snake? And 
every time I go through the feed and I see the snake, I'm like, oh, um, you know, because I have this deep seated fear of snakes. And so, you know, if I'm highly emotionally aroused and I'm um, not in a nice sort of present state, I probably need to think twice about relying on my gut because my gut is probably going to go more for that instinct side. Whereas mm -hmm. if I'm in a nice present state and I've been keeping my gut nice and healthy, feeding it lots of different good things, then I can rely more on the intuition that comes from the years of wisdom that you've had working in a particular space. So if it's a space that you know a lot about um, right. and you're in a good emotional state, you're much more likely to make a good call with your gut. Whereas if you're highly aroused, you're in a novel state, you don't know much about it, you might just want to check yourself with some other um, tools and processes just to make sure you know, test your gut, make sure you're on the right track. I I, I completely agree. And as, as much as I um, joke about like, well, how many entrepreneurs actually sit and check themselves? Um, I'm also doing my doctorate. So I kind of believe in both sides of of, of the scale. So I, 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 I love that um, um, advice. Ambiguity apocalypse game yeah is it really that bad <laughs> is the <laughs> apocalypse really coming from ambiguity oh look look it's a nice play on words isn't it but yes um, i love that yeah yeah well, what is it mom. first of all what's the <laughs> game about uh samantha rush and i we both did our accreditation for indicator of ambiguity at the same time and we were thinking about when you go into a workplace to help people um, get into a state where they really can learn something, we wanted to get away from going in and asking people, reflect on a time when this happened. You know, we, mm -hmm. we just wanted to do something that really made it recent and real for people, but also some fun. Um, because we wanted people to be able to connect and really understand um, the concepts. And so we developed this game um, where we looked at what is it that we want people to experience. So it's a real mix of not just ambiguity, there's complexity, decision-making, time pressure, you know, um, uncertainty, you know, unexpected things happening. And um and it's a lot of teamwork as well because you've got to work together with your team and you're competing against other teams. And so it's about giving people that recency of experience so mm -hmm. that they can really reflect on it. So then when we go through and talk about their results on the diagnostic assessment or not, because sometimes we just do it um, without, um, and then we start talking about the skills, they make a lot more sense. And then we play the game again and we incentivize people to use the skills. So okay. by the time they leave, they've actually not just know it up here, they've started to do it in practice and it becomes um, easier to translate that back into the workplace. But it's lots of fun. Um, and look, it's interesting when we see um, rooms playing it because you can see sometimes some people, and you just know they have a really very low tolerance of ambiguity, really um struggle with it but you also see their team members helping them manage the uncertainty so mm -hmm. you start to see how it should be working in the workplace in practice as people are are playing it and having some fun in a context that look let's face it have you ever faced a zombie apocalypse at work <laughs> so we wanted to level the playing field and just make sure that we weren't advancing you're advantaging one group or industry over anyone else. It was just something that um, isn't terribly familiar to everybody. No, I, I like that. And I like, um, yes, we both know Kieran and we both know about um, I am and the ambiguity um, assessment. And 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 it's, it's just wonderful to have a talking, a format or a means to talk a little bit more about it as a group after. So but I, I just had to um, ask about the ambiguity apocalypse. <laughs> um, 
So over your shoulder, you're all about thriving and complexity. And I know we've talked about complexity and ambiguity, yeah. but tell us why that. Um, well, I came out of health and community services industries, and I did a lot of reform work, I suppose, in um, health, lots of challenges that are very, very complex. And um, when I left public service, I asked a whole heap of people who um, had worked with me in different ways at different times, you know, what were some of the things that they really thought of when they thought of me? And this was a theme that came up just in terms of um, complexity. And so and I'm, I'm quite evidence-based. So I've, although I'm intuitive, I also like to know what does the evidence say? And um, and so I've spent a bit of time really understanding what the what does that look like in different ways? So it's not just pure complexity theory. I do a lot of leadership coaching and facilitation techniques and how I bring all of that together. And if I sort of think about what thriving in complexity means, if I go back to really early in my career, um, I was working in um, medical workforce. The state that I live in was tripling the number of medical graduates and we had two years notice that the system wasn't going to have the capacity to train them all and get them through the mandatory um, job sort of um, term, the, the mandatory terms that they needed to do in a hospital so that they could be registered as a doctor, which is pretty catastrophic when you right. think that um, we had a shortage of doctors. <laughs> so we were training them and then they weren't going to be out of practice. So it was sort of referred to as a tsunami. And back in those days, it really got me thinking about what does it mean to ride the wave? And to me, thriving in complexity is actually, look, the seas may be rough, but it's looking at, you know, if you're on, on that board as a surfer, where's your entry point? And then it's sensing what's going on. And it's being that sort of intuition, but also knowing what you know about techniques and a whole range of things and using those skills and that sensing ability to find your way through. And look, sometimes it might be a bit terrifying, you know, the wave's really huge and it feels a bit overwhelming, but having confidence that you can find your way through and just enjoying that journey as well right, and not right. giving in to the overwhelm and, um, and eventually coming out and looking back and going, wow, look what we achieved, you know, and you're, we, we addressed the problem, you know, we got all of those doctors registered and, for me, it was learning. It wasn't all about me. It was about who was surfing with me and it was how you tap in and get into that synchronicity and um, help each other, you know, create space in the waves so that everyone's coming through it together. So that's for me, what thriving and complexity means. It sounds good. I, I do want to ask you about one last thing. A mm -hmm. recent blog, Why Being at Ease with Liminality Increases Your Potential. Can you, ex first, like, what is liminality? Yeah. And so it's that. Yeah. Oh, sorry. No, you're right. Yeah, no, no. no. <laughs> yeah, just what is liminality? And then we can talk about its application. Yeah, so it's that in-between place where you're no longer who you used to be. So you really let go, started to let go of all of those tightly held sense of self, the ego that's constraining you, but you're not yet fully who you're going to be next. And you're in that in-between space. And, and how being at ease with that increases your potential for growth. Yeah. So I like to think of it as a space where you give yourself permission to just try on different versions of yourself to experiment to see um what feels right what gets the type of responses you know um it's about reflecting on how did that work did that feel comfortable did it um get me the sort of result that i was looking for and it's actually giving yourself some space 
to just let some possibilities emerge. So you, you, we get so caught up, I think, in the world today with having to get from A to B really, really quickly. And yet that doesn't serve us because we go from one locked down state of being to another locked down state of being. And when we think about how do you thrive in complexity, it's all that you've got to do the sensing, you've got to do you know the experimenting. And the reality is I think we're going to go through more and more liminal spaces as the world around us rapidly speeds up the way in which it's evolving. And so getting comfortable with sitting in that discomfort of not mm-hmm. having that really concrete sense of who I am but actually finding the joy in um, trying out new and and different things and accepting it's okay to not have this really, really concrete sense of who I am. It doesn't mean you throw all your values out the window. It just means you're playing around with what that looks like and feels like in practice and staying open to new ideas and, and new options. I, I listen to that and, and I, I think back to a funny anecdote. My late father was um, also an entrepreneur and he used to say, Ken, how's it going? You know, just with the business. And I'd say, we're getting there. And eventually said, in in terms that I won't repeat on here, but um, what the hell does that mean? I said, we're a work in progress. Yeah. And, and he just shook his head. I th- I think that, becoming comfortable with who we are, with a state of incompleteness, with a possibility. Um, I think that's a wonderful place to leave it. So Suzanne Le Boutoulier, sorry, I'll go with my Canadian pronunciation, <laughs> thriving complexity. Um, thank you so much for, for joining us on Say Hi to the Future. Ken, thank you so much. And yeah, let's say hi to the future. Let's open it. Welcome it with open arms. Take care. You too.